and the, there's the score distribution. Um, so again, I mean, 60% of you got an A or a B, so I can't feel too, I mean, and that's without any weighting. So I think this was like 61% were between an 80. And then again, one of you or a couple of you got almost a perfect score. So again, it's kind of hard to do a lot of weighting here. Um, but then, I mean, it, there was some drop off here significantly. Um, you know, C's get degrees, as the <laughs> saying goes. <laughs> it's always been true. Um, I wanted to see what, yeah, so here's more of the stats. You guys can see this kind of stuff on the, on the website? Okay. Um, so I was curious how, like, if you did well on the last one, did you do well on this one? So this is the score of exam two versus exam one. And it, there wasn't a lot of correlation. I kind of thought there would be more than there was. Um, so some of you really hurt yourself on this one, and some of you really pulled it together on this one. Um, so then I went and looked at what's the average. So here I averaged these two. And again, um, I think more than half have an A or a B. And this is without any of the homework weighted in, right? So the homework, again, will should help you. Um, so, any questions on that? Yeah. I mean, my plan is to keep it at the 90, 80, 70, 60 for now. Um, like the and, traditional like, grading? Yeah. And then to... Well, let me, let me rephrase that. Um, like, for th if, this was, if this was my final grade set, what I've done in the past is look for natural breaks. So I would probably pull an A down to, like, there. Right? Because see how there's kind of a break there? And then I, and then I would look here, and there's kind of a, a break right around there. So I would probably call a B that. So there's two ways to do it. One is to look for those kind of natural breaks. The other one is to just weight it all up to 100 and then just be really strict about 90, 80, 70, 60. What's yeah. your philosophy on the fractional grades, like pluses and minuses? And um, I generally do like 97 to 93. I mean, what is, does that impact your life a lot? Yes. Really? Yes. How? Yeah. Why? Uh, we might not be able to get into grad school based on a minus. So because it, it impacts the, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is what, I mean, like, grades are so important for a while, and then they're, like, not important at all, because, like, I yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so, l let me tell you. So, here's what the rest of the quarter is going to look like. Um, so, I kind of rearranged this significantly based on, you know, the crystallography a background. And so, we're going to do a lot of surface science stuff, which hopefully is new. So, today we're going to talk about Langmuir isotherms and then BET isotherms, so different ways of characterizing the surface area of a material, okay? My hunch is that the exam you just took is gonna be the hardest one, um, is my suspicion. Um, and that I suspect this last one will be kind of easier. Um, so we're gonna go through that. Thanksgiving, of course, the fr we'll, we will meet the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Um, the front, but I mean, again, I've, it will be videotaped, so if you want to head out of town earlier, that's your prerogative. Uh, Friday, of course, after is canceled. Um, I have a couple of here as being to be determined because just based on prior experience, we tend to run long, so we may not have time to get into some of this. This, okay, so this week, I feel bad, but like, I was invited to give a lecture at the University of Pennsylvania, which is important for my career. I need to go do that. Um, <laughs> it's Penn, okay? Um, this day I have a conference and I'm out of town. So those two days, I'm gone, okay? So I felt pretty good about not missing class, but I am gonna miss on these two days. So this one, um, I'm gonna send you the link so you don't have to come to class. I'm gonna sit in here and lecture to, to Rosie and um, make it together. This is gonna be about how do we put nanoparticles together into hierarchical assembly? What are the chemical principles when we go from taking individual gold particles or individual silica particles and start putting them into these metamaterials or hierarchical assembly? So it should be kind of interesting. Um, there will be something on it from the exam. Um, Okay, but you don't have to come to class on this day because it'll be online. 
The sixth, we'll have Yi Chen, who's going to teach you biological principles of foundations of nanoengineering biological principles. So you'll have him next quarter. So that'll be kind of a lead in. And you will, there will be something on that from the exam. Because we'll, we'll also tape it. Yeah? Isn't the physical principles the next I, my mistake, yeah. So but whenever you get to bio, it'll be him. Um, 7th of December, so which is the day before the exam. Again, I'm going to be gone, but I wanna, I'm going to try my, I'm going to try really hard. In fact, I will make it happen where there'll be some kind of review session like we've been doing for the exam. So it'll probably be, uh, Rosie will have a conference room and I'll be like Skyped in, somehow like that. Or if you want to call me, I'll, I'll have like a two hour window where you can call my cell phone or somehow I'll have it worked out. So there will be, there will be a review session before the exam, okay? Last exam is then gonna be on the 8th of December in class, okay? That following Monday, I'll be back. And so in the afternoon, location to be determined, um, I'll have a conference room where you can come and get that final exam, which will be useful to study for the final final. Okay, and another little review session for a couple hours on the afternoon of that Monday. Okay, and then my goal is to upload final grades on the 11th of December. So if you're in that situation of plus minus is going to ruin my life, like reach out to me that week. I should know by like the, th the morning of the 14th how the final grades will be. So if this is really important to you. Um, I'll w I will be available 13, 14 before I submit final grades. Okay? Okay. Um, surface area. Who's ever been to a Korean sauna, a Korea spa? Yeah, they're great, aren't they? <laughs> they're amazing. <laughs> um, so I went to, I, I've only recently discovered, so you go in and then you pay your money and you are split by gender. So men go one way, women go the other way, completely naked in the first part, right? So they've got all these different hot tubs. So these are all different temperatures. There's like these really, really powerful showers, um, a really, really hot sauna, a middle hot sauna, um, and there's a cold plunge, like this thing where you pull on a string and it drops all this cold water on you. They're great, okay? <laughs> so you do that part, then you go, and they give you this little <laughs> costume, right? And so it's like super baggy. I, um, I hate baggy stuff, but I finally got one small enough that I could fit. And so it's color coded by gender, right? So like the, the men have these blue ones and then women have pink or orange or something like that. Then you go into the co-ed area, okay? So now you're down in this co-ed area and they've got all these dry saunas, okay? So dry sauna one, dry sauna two, and like depending on how big and expensive they are, they'll be anywhere from two to like eight different themed dry saunas, okay? And they all have these different kinds of themes to them, right? So there'll be, there'll be one that's ice, there'll be one that's really hot, but they always have one that's, that's got charcoal, and then they always have one that's have these red clay balls, Okay, so there's always these, the red clay ball room and you go in and you um, lay down in this and you like s roll around in this clay. Okay, so what do you think's going on? What's the philosophy for having charcoal and red clay in your dry sauna? What do you think's the point? Water, sweat. You, you said the word. What was your first, what was the verb? Absorbs. Absorbs, right? And it's because this stuff has a ton of specific surface area, right? This stuff is super porous, right? You guys know this stuff, Active Wow? It's amazing. I just discovered it. It's like this charcoal that you rub on your teeth and it turns your teeth super black and then you wash it off and your teeth are white, right? Again, it's this activated charcoal that um, has a lot of surface area. Similarly, what if you go eat five handfuls of ecstasy tablets? What are they going to do, right? They're going to go fill your stomach full of activated charcoal, right? And it's because it has a ton of surface area that can absorb stuff. So activated or active charcoal has a high degree of microporosity, 
with just one gram of activated carbon having a surface area over 32,000 square feet, right? So think about a gram of that stuff having that much surface area, okay? Wow. So how do, you, how do we start to measure this, right? And that's what we're going to talk about today is how do we measure this ability, measure and characterize this ability um, to absorb stuff, okay? Um, this is something we use a lot in my lab. These are mesoporous silica particles. Have you been exposed to this in earlier classes a little bit? This stuff is neat. So I'm sure you've seen my cells, right? So the way you make this uh, material is you develop these my cells and then you grow silica dioxide on top of it. And then using either strong acid, strong base or heat, you go and burn out the my cell leaving you with this porous structure, okay? And so that's what these, this regular repeating pattern is where there were originally my cells. The dark part is the silica that's grown around it. And then after we remove the, the template, we're left with this porous structure, okay? So this material also has a lot of surface area. And um, so characterizing it then is part of what we're doing. Um, with this. Okay, so we should define a few terms. Um, first one is the substrate. So that's the solid surface where absorption is happening. Okay, and the adsorbate is what is going on to the surface. So here at the adsorbate is these blue balls that are going on the surface of the substrate. Okay, um, remember we're dealing with, so I think you said absorption, right? And what we're actually doing is adsorption, right? So we're taking a material and putting it on the surface of something rather than going inside of it. Okay, so even, this, even in this situation, right, this, this is a three-dimensional nanoparticle, okay? And we, we may have the, 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 the uh, adsorbate deep inside of the particle, but it's still on a surface, okay? As opposed to think of something like a polymer, a polymeric nanoparticle, where it is physically absorbing the material, right? These are, because this is all some kind of surface, even if it's a surface that's deep inside of the, of the particle, okay? Um, and the way that people characterize this is called an isotherm, and so, and isotherm simply means done at the same temperature. And in all of these situations, we're generally plotting the amount of absorbed stuff as a function of concentration or pressure of that stuff, okay? So in uh, Andrea Tao's chapter, she's, she derives it um, or expresses it in terms of pressure. The derivation we're gonna do today, we're gonna use the notation of concentration. But this should make sense, right? That as pressure or concentration goes up, the more of this stuff you have on the surface. Yes, question. Um, so instead of pressure, could you just sub in temperature into the x-axis Oh, could you plot this at um, temperature? It's a much harder experiment to do because you would could only do that like at the saturated condition. Right, because how do you know that changes here are due to, because you just have one or more here or uh, because it was due to temperature, right? That would be a harder. What about like the, uh, given the temperature and pressure are directly, um, like I mean, what you could do is do this exact same pressure or concentration. N, let's assume it's this linear situation. So if this is T equals 300K, is solid line, what would that look like at 330K? Would it just be shifted up? Well, shifted up like this? Yeah. Why? Um, well, if you increase the temperature, like, if volume, pressure also goes up. 
right? So wouldn't that also affect the number of particles absorbed? So for this to achieve, let's say this is 10 nitrogen atoms. And let's say this is one atmosphere. Okay, so if I now raise the temperature, do I need more or less atmospheres to also get 10? Less. More pressure. More pressure, right? That makes sense because if you have, if you have nitrogens on the surface, there's going to be inherently some on and off, right? But if I increase the temperature, it's going to be pushing it towards more thermal energy and more off. So I think the better way to think about it is so like that. Okay, makes sense. Right, at a higher temperature. Could it just be a linear shift or would it change the shape? The, well, assuming that it is linear, um, it, we're, we would assume that it would stay linear. But yeah. Could we see a change in slope? Um, I'm sure you could. I'm sure people have studied this, but I think this is probably the easiest way to, to think about it. Yeah. That's a good test question right there. <laughs> yes. Um, so this is, this is one kind of this isotherm. Um, what we're going to spend most of our time talking about today is what's known as the Langmuir isotherm. Because the Langmuir isotherm goes through a, a, has a small portion where it's relatively linear. And then it has another portion where the number of absorbed things is equal to the total number of sites that you have. Right? But in between, there's this kind of variable region, okay? And so there's a number of terms that people have derived to try to characterize um, materials that behave this way. Okay, so let's think of some of the assumptions. So, I mean, again, this is, this is a model. There's four kind of pretty popular models for describing this. Um, we're gonna talk about two of them in, in a fair amount of detail. Um, the Langmuir has kind of stood the test of time because it works kind of pretty, kind of okay, uh, pretty well. So imagine you have some surface that has all of these binding sites. So one assumption is that all sites are equivalent, okay? So if you have clean materials, clean nanoparticles, that's a pretty good bet um, that all sites are equivalent. Um, but again, this is gonna be a function of how good of a synthetic a nano engineer you are. You're gonna assume that each site can hold one nitrogen molecule. Okay, and as the pressure increases, the number of molecules also increases. Okay, so this is perhaps where this fails the most, is the notion that you only have one per site. Okay, it just stands to reason that you'll probably get stuff like that, right? Okay. But this is called the BET isotherm, and that's what we'll talk about either at the end of class or next period. Okay? Um, once the surface is full, increasing the P does not increase the number of molecules observed any further, right? And that's what we're showing here, right? We're completely saturated. Okay? So did we cover all these? Gases behave ideally, um, only a monolayer forms, no, all sites on the surface are equivalent. No interaction but toward the adsorbates. Yes, so that's a key assumption, that when we put in this, that we don't get some kind of reaction and form like a different species, like where circle goes to square, okay? So when people, yeah. When you say no interactions, you mean no reactions, or do you mean like no, we assume there's Both, no both, no, re no reactions and no, um, chemical, yeah, no chemical um, electrostatic forces as well, yeah. Um, so the, so what do you think would be a good adsorbate to use for this? Lo okay, there you go. Um, and so nitrogen is, is, I mean, it's not a noble gas, but it's pretty darn inert, right? And so nitrogen is what people most commonly use for these kind of experiments. Um, 
and that the adsorbate molecule is immobile. I th and what we mean there is um, that I th when it's on this spot, there's no like lateral diffusion. It can, of course, go on and off. Okay. Okay. What causes it to absorb to the surface? Then? Pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, it's a ch charge of the surface. Um, it, it, so there are electrostatic forces or Van der Waals forces there. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to derive this beast. It's actually not that bad. Um, okay. So let's define a few things. So here's our surface. And we're going to call our thing that's absorbing B. Okay? Just for fun. So therefore, CB... Well, first of all, let me back up. Here's how you actually would do this, these kinds of experiments. You take your mystery nanoparticle, okay, and so you have some flask, okay, and you fill it full of B. Okay, and then you sprinkle in your nanoparticle, okay, and then you shake it and let it cook for some time, and then you centrifuge it down, and so you get this pellet of nanoparticle that has absorbed B, right? But you still have some B in solution, right? Then you repeat this with a higher concentration of nanoparticle and another higher concentration of nanoparticle, and another higher concentration of nanoparticle, okay? And we're gonna have an example about that. But I thought, I just wanna tell you this so we can say that this is our CB, our concentration of B, okay? Of adsorbate, okay? And CB0, initial concentration of B before nanoparticle. Okay, so here we have C, B naught, and then this is C, B, right? Because we've lost some B to their interaction with the nanoparticle. Yeah? The, by, you can do it both ways. By far the most common is to change your concentration of the nanoparticle, the mass of the nanoparticle. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've also got Q, which is the volume of liquid. So here's Q, volume of liquid. Um, now, we also have this little QB, which is concentration of adsorbate on nanoparticle. Okay? That makes sense. What's weird about this field is how, how variable the units are. So, Perhaps the most common is in moles per gram, but you'll also see uh, milligrams per gram, right, in a mass unit, okay, where you're talking about the concentration of your adsorbate in a mass unit. So if you see milligrams per gram, don't be, don't be flipped out, okay. Then this one is kind of confusing because the surface area is going to be expressed in a mass unit. Because how else can you know your surface area of these nanoparticles, right? The end unit of how you express this, like look how we express that activated charcoal. I said it was 3,000 square meters per gram, okay? So that's where we're going with this. It's always going to be expressed like that in terms of surface area per gram, because there's no way that you can, 
do like measure physically measure the surface area of something like these mesoporous silica particles. I mean, you might say, well, I could do Archimedes method, right? Why don't you think that works? The vol. I mean, how could you possibly get? I mean, the surface tension to try to get liquid into all of those pores would never work. There is a whole field called porosometry where they tend to use mercury, um, but it's for materials that are much bigger than this. Okay. Um, okay, so surface area in grams. Okay, so then we can write a mass balance equation for this. Um, where our volume times our concentration of B initially is equal to volume times concentration that's free. Okay, so this is total moles. <coughs> this is moles in solution. And this is moles on surface. Make sense? So what would that look like if we plotted it? There's some are there's some CB naught, our highest concentration. Does it make sense that all of our CBs have to be lower than our CB naught, right? Because all of these, all of these other concentrations, all of these other CBs, have had some B removed because of the nanoparticle, right? So CB is always going to be lower than CB naught. Okay. So, do, 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 and here, so at this point where CB is zero, all B is on the surface. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't label my axis. Okay. So this is how much is on the surface of the nanoparticle, and this is how much is free in solution, okay? And at this point, if that is zero, then it's all in solution, right? If QB is zero, then it's all in solution. So we have a relationship like that. Okay, and we can show this by solving Okay, so I just solved this expression for QB Okay so let's think about this. This is a constant. Our volume is a constant. Our surface area is a constant. Okay? So really, we only have this varying. And so that's why we have this QB roughly equals negative CB, right? This negative relationship. Okay, as more is on the surface, less is free in solution, and vice versa. Okay. So this is this is our mass balance relationship.
Yeah. Um, you're, you're right. So let, maybe it would be like a negative K times concentration of CB. There's some kind of negative relationship. These are not directly proportional. These are inversely proportional. Yes. Good point. Okay, so now let's think a little bit more about what's happening with this B and the fact that it is indeed in equilibrium, right? And that there's a K on and a K off, right? Just like almost all things on the planet, okay? So we can think about this as CB plus an open site going to QB, right? Where this, if these are all sites, here's an open site, right? Concentration of B floating in solution is in equilibrium with the number of open sites to interact with this, right? So if we have a lot, if we have a lot of open sites, by Le Chatelier's principle, we're going to push it towards more on the surface, right? Similarly, if we have a lot of concentration of B, by Le Chatelier's principle, we're gonna push it towards more QB, more B on the surface, okay? Um, Okay, so then we can write this as this equilibrium constant over Do you believe that? That makes sense, right? Yeah. Okay, so then QB also equals KEQ times CB times the number of open sites. Okay. Um, and again, this is now a linear relationship. Um, when we have a lot of open sites, that's when we're in Got back to the sauna. That's when we're either in a situation like this or here where we have a ton of open sites down here. And this, this line is essentially linear right there. Okay. Um, so how else can we define the number of open sites? Well, I should have defined this up at the beginning. If ST is the total number of sites, then open sites is ST minus QB. Okay. And so then we can write this as KEQ equals QB over CB, total number of sites, minus QB. Okay. This generally has units of liters per mole or liters per gram. And that's because this would be in like generally moles per gram. This would generally be moles per liter moles per gram, moles per gram, that would cancel, leaving you with liters per mole. Yeah? So what exactly is here? This equilibrium constant. Uh, so see if equilibrium of yep. the Yep. Okay, so this is kind of an important thing. Put a box around this one. Um, 
And then the other thing that's kind of important is when we rearrange this to be, to define it in terms of QB. Okay, so I just cross multiplied and then solved for QB. And then we can take it one step forward and what the literature tends to describe is this theta, which is QB over ST. So it's the percent occupied sites, right? percent occupied equals K E Q C B over one plus K E Q C B. Did I get that right? Yes. And this is the one that Andrea has in her book. The, the one difference is I think she just writes it as just plain K, just a boring, sad little K. And then this she writes as P. Okay, but that makes sense, right? That if we were just doing this experiment in a liquid versus a gas, we would increase the pressure, decrease the pressure, increase the concentration, decrease the concentration. Yeah. So is open science more of a concentration? It's weird to think about it as a concentration, but you kind of can, right? So we could write this as moles per gram, right? If I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, open sites per gram of material, right? How would you measure that? It's, it's, a, it's not an abstract thing, right? You would do, so assuming for nitrogen, what would you do? What's that? Of? Well, that's what you're trying to measure, but what do you know about nitrogen? Yeah, but you know its size, right? So you can, you can say, I know that each nitrogen is 0.17 nanometers or whatever it is, 0.1, yeah, 0.17 nanometers. And so then if I can measure how many nitrogens are there, I can start to really get some, some details on the surface area of my material. Okay? Yeah. How, what sort of assumptions do we make in uh, how close they pack? And we can slide around to a bit more. Yeah, I, my, uh, the way I understand it is you assume that they are, I don't want to say touching, but kind of touching. Um, Marbles in a pipe hand. Yeah, kind of like, like, kind of like this is drawn. I mean, the, the big thing about this equation is that you're just assuming you don't get these multiple layers. Right? Yeah. Okay, so let's, oh good, I have this slide, so this is perfect. So when we have um, this, um, so here they're plotting it as N, but does this make sense that this is the same as QB, right? So, So this is CB and this is QB, okay, which is what we're plotting here, okay? So when this thing is very, very small, let's just say this term is 0 0.0001, right? What does that simplify to? It basically, if KEQ I should give myself enough space to do this properly. If KEQ CB is much, much less than one, then we basically have QB equals some kind of constant times the total number of sites. Right? Let's just assume this is very, very, very small. So it's small relative to one, so we could ignore it. That's this spot. So we have a linear relationship. Right? 
if k e q c b is much much greater than one so let's assume that it's like a thousand so then we have a thousand times s t over a thousand and one which is basically QB equals ST. So that's this region. And then everything else is in between. Okay, so this is linear or saturation. And similarly, this is linear at low concentration. Because we have so many open sites here, right? Okay. Hang in there. We're almost to the to the most useful part. And this is like poor poor your poor TA has actually done this dozens and dozens of times. So this is perhaps one of the most useful things. Because think about when you would need this, right? Like Say you want, to have, you want to quantitate the amount of drug on a particle, right? Or the amount of ecstasy tablets that can be absorbed per your new fancy overdose medicine, right? Um, you, you want to be in that trial? Is that one? No, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's rearrange... Um, Let's re oh, I erased it. Remember when we had it defined, you have an expression where it's defined KEQ equals? Okay, go train your eye back on that one. And we can write this as um, Yes, so I just rearranged that last one right there. Okay. And do, 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 do. I'm sorry, I got lost. I'm sorry. Um, so we're just going to start right back there where we were. And what if we write that as 1 over QB? equals 1 plus k e q over k e q c b s t okay and now what if we could write this i missed a c b This cancels. <clears throat> Finally, we have our Y equals MX plus B for this kind of situation, okay, which holds across this entire situation. We've tweaked this expression. So now, y intercept equals st, and slope, well, 1 over st. Slope equals 1 over keq st because our y equals 1 over qb and our x equals 1 over cb. Okay? So what poor Fong Chen did all last summer was add nanoparticles to dye 
and um, would get data like this. So, um, so here we have pink drug with nanoparticles in solution, allow that to cook, spin it down, and this, the drug or the dye sticks to the nanoparticles and the supernatant is clear, right? And so as we add more or less nanoparticles, we deplete more or less drug from the solution. So this is gonna be your first homework problem. Let's say we, we had varying amounts of nanoparticles to 500 mils of solution containing 1.2 milligrams per mil of drug with a molecular weight of 690 grams per mole. So in each flask here is a fresh flask, right? It's not as if we are, you know, using the same flask. So each flask has a new initial fresh amount of drug with different amounts of nanoparticle. Then you measure how much is left over. Okay, plot the Langmuir isotherm and determine K, E, Q, and S, T. Okay, so what you've got to do is get it into this kind of form. So what do you think is the first thing you would do? And I'll send this to you in Excel so you can not have to punch it in. What's the first step you would do? Because this... If you know initial drug and you know residual drug in solution, then you can do just some kind of simple math there and calculate drug absorbed, right? And then from that, by knowing your Q, I told you Q equals 500 mils, right? Then you can start to get the drug absorbed, okay? Anybody guess the next one? Because this is still, we're still, we have, we don't have QB yet. Remember how we defined QB? No, what do we have to do? We have to normalize it to... Moles per gram, right? So, or milligrams per gram. Right, so we take milligrams of drug per milligrams of nanoparticles. If you wanted to at this step, go and convert to moles and do moles per gram, fine. Either, either way should get you the same answer. So now we have QB, okay, that's pretty cool. So we have that. Now, how are we gonna get, what do we need? We still need, we have our Y, we need our X. So that would be the inverse of which column? I labeled it, damn, I gave it away. So it's CB, right? So then you can take one over CB, but don't forget to do one over your QB. And when you plot this, you should be able to get this kind of details. Okay? Okay, good, that was perfect timing. We'll see you on Wednesday.